estamos listos para recibir en este escenario a nuestro invitado especial, futurista, humanista, autor de Technology vs. Humanity y CEO de Futures Agency, para que dicte su conferencia Exponential Transformation, a Science Fiction is Becoming a Science Fact. Can your company keep up? Le recordamos que pueden ingresar a sm40.mx para realizar sus preguntas en la sección Live Q&A. Y, y les contamos que tenemos contraducción simultánea en la parte posterior del auditorio sin costo. Damos una muy cordial bienvenida a Ger Leonhardt. Hola. Not bad, huh? So this, this machine is science fiction, right? I mean, it's interesting to see that we talked about this for a long time and it's finally working, but let me ask you a key question. My translator in the back, Hector, do you think he will be unemployed because of this? Well, the answer is, you know, right now, not really, right? because this machine does a very simple translation. But it is, in fact, what we call artificially intelligent. Right? And this machine learns every time I speak something, it learns more about me. And it gets better. And in 10 years, this machine can translate what I say now, when I speak slowly. Huh? But United Nations conversation, a political speech, Maybe not ever. It's a very good lesson for us for the future. What we do changes, but humans are going to stay in work in different ways, which I'll explain shortly. This is why transformation is so important. This is why we have to talk about what transformation actually is. And you know, the most important thing from today really is that transformation is not about technology. Technology is everywhere now. It's like breathing. <laughs> So we use technology everywhere. Transformation is about culture. How do we change how we look at the world? What do we understand about the future? The successful companies today that have transformed, including German companies like Mercedes-Benz and many others, you know, how, they have, how have they changed? They changed because they changed their culture. They changed the way that they look at things. So it's very important that we look at this in, in a different way. Also. I think many of you may have noticed the last couple of years, there's a lot of people who are shocked by the future. In fact, I would go as far as saying that people are sometimes afraid of the future. They have what Elvin Toffler called the future shock. And I get to hear this a lot when I speak to people that are saying, oh, you know, the future is not going to be good because we have climate change, and then we have these strange political things that happened, which I will not comment on in more detail. Uh, and then, of course, we have machines who will take our job. The robots will take our job, and then afterwards they will kill us. That, that's what you hear from science fiction. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you, yes, the robots will take our job if our job is like a robot. If your job is being a robot, then a robot will take your job. You know, that's quite very obvious, and I will talk more about what that means. But the opportunity really is, I think the future is better than we think. I think we have to think positively about the future. We can always focus on the problems, but you know, we've solved so many things in the past. We're going to solve in the next 20 years energy. We're going to solve the water problem. We're going to solve diseases. What we can't solve with technology is how we live, you know, social and political things. That will take a little bit more effort than a new app. You know? So if you want to be successful in the future, technology is a tool, and it's a, it's a powerful tool. But transformation is really how we look at the world and how we need to pay more attention. So let me start with this. We're going to be navigating what I call the game changers. Uh, there's nine of them. Uh, in my book, which we'll have later on for a book signing, uh, the book is called Technology versus Humanity. I explain that in details, but basically what's happening here is that we have cloud computing, 
we have the blockchain, we have all the things that you read about every single day, and they're basically going to be changing our world up and down in the next couple of decades. And so the question is, how do you navigate these game changes? And not just you, but you know, also, of course, our government. Global government, local government, international government, national government, because there's going to be a lot of challenges. But the opportunities, you know, McKinsey says roughly the digital transformation is roughly a hundred trillion dollar opportunity, if you get it right. So it's going to take a little bit of wisdom. And so for what I would recommend for you is those four steps that I use to understand this. First, to observe, to pay attention. If I ask you today, can you tell me what your company is going to be doing in five years? What exactly? How are you going to make money? Do you have an answer? Or is it just the same, just better? Well, the fact is, you know, I used to be in the music business. A long time ago, I was a musician and producer. And then I did some musical, uh, musical uh, digital startups. And in those days, you know, we sold music. You know those round plastic discs called CDs? Remember those? Yeah? And where's the music now? Up, up there. Music is in the cloud. And you guys have Spotify right here. I think it's about 200 uh, pesos a month or so for Spotify, right? For 200 pesos, you get 21 million songs. What is the unit price? Zero. Right? I mean, our world has changed. We have to observe. We have to understand. Now, understanding does not mean reading smart reports or listening to futurist speakers. Right? Uh, understanding means to go inside. I mean, you can, you can listen to your kids and see what information they give you, but to understand your kids, if you have kids, that's a whole different thing. Right? You have to actually go inside. Then you have to imagine things, and then you transform. This is very important, I think, for our future, the skills that we need. Let me start with this important slide that I use a lot, the, the nature of exponentiality. And, uh, you know Moore's law and Matkov's law, technology doubles in power every 12, 16, 24 months, depending on which way you're looking. So we have this curve. This is very hard for us to understand. You know how humans think, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, linear, because we're organic. Technology takes leaps. So the, the mobile phone that I use now, it has the same computing power than the machine that brought the Americans to the moon. And the mobile phone I use in 10 years will have a million times the capacity of the one I have now. So we're going to live in a world that's dramatically different. So the, the key thing that's happening is exponential and convergent, right? Industries are converging. If you're in healthcare and medical, your industry is converging with technology. Genetic engineering, CRISPR, that's technology. If you're in the car industry, your industry is converging with technology. If you're in the media business, it already has converged with technology. I mean, this is things that we have to remember. When you go up the scale, it's very dangerous to think linear. 10 years from now, we're going to be roughly at 512. That's 50x as different. So your children will live in a world where they don't know how to drive a car because the car drives itself. You speak to it. They will not know what the book looks like. That's very sad, but maybe there'll be some books around in different ways. They will definitely not know what a CD or a DVD looks like. I mean, we're going to have mind-boggling changes, most of them very positive, but also quite demanding, which is why I say business as usual is dead or dying. If your business is still functioning like it did 10 years ago, you're just extremely lucky. And it will sooner or later happen to you. I mean, look at the media business, the music business, the film business, the book business, the publishing business, the tourism business, Airbnb. I mean, all these things are happening right? completely different than just 10 years ago. So if you're in banking or insurance or government or mining or gas and oil, give it 10 years, you, know, you get to the same place. And that's a, a gigantic opportunity. We have to understand how we get there. You know, give you some examples here from the car industry. Okay? What's happening in the car industry, we're going to have the possibility of having a pretty much unlimited battery power. I mean, any of you in this room have an electric car? Yeah, anybody? OK, not very many. We have some in Switzerland. But yeah, if the car only goes 300 kilometers, it's kind of a pain, you know? 
But those cars you know, in the very near future, they're going to reach 1,000 kilometers, 2,000 kilometers in three years, and then 5,000 kilometers in five years, and in 10 years, you fill it up once. And the price will be one-tenth of what it is today. So this is basically what's happening in the car industry. We have to get ready for this, because if you make engine parts for a regular car, transmission, gas engine parts, you have a window of five to 10 years until that's no longer needed. You need it for the old cars that we still have, of course, right? but not for the new cars. And you see that this, the, the forecast here is quite clear. Hybrid cars, electric cars, hydrogen cars, everything else declining. Is that the end of the car industry? No, it's the new beginning. I mean, look at the music business. Again, as a comparison, it was $44 billion 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and then the internet came and killed it. Okay. Went down to $14 billion. Now we have music in the cloud, streaming. It's 1.5 billion a month is what people are paying, about 110 million subscribers. It's going to go back to 50 billion. So the key question you have to ask yourself when you're talking about transformation is not where the money is, because the money is being generated, but, but if you're going to get it. I always say to the record labels, there's new money in the music business, but you're not, you're not going to get it because you've, you've waited too long. We have to think about what that means when cars can actually fly, as we have said in science fiction circles. But this here is a much closer reality. These cars are not autonomous in the sense of they, they can't go anywhere. They can only go on fixed routes. I guarantee you we're going to have lots and lots of cities in the world where we're going to take electric cars that drive like a robot on fixed roads from the hotel to the airport and but you cannot take them up to the mountains for a nice week weekend or so. Right? They would not know what to do. <laughs> but this is going to change our cities. And uh, you know, many, I think many of us already are quite aware of this, that in the car industry and transportation, we're going to see like a Spotify for cars. It's completely obvious. Already, it was already happening in the US, Mercedes-Benz and BMW, Porsche. You know, so you can, you can basically buy a subscription, then you take whatever car you want or you can take the scooter, right? or even the helicopter <laughs> with the same subscription. So, today's unusual may quickly be tomorrow's normal. This here, for example, is a company called Weisun in China. They do 3D printed houses. They make houses from a printer. Okay. This house here, I saw the other day when I was in China, uh, this house here has printed the outside and the inside in four days. They're printing the concrete, and this concrete is 100% recyclable. I mean, any of you in the construction business, you know what that means, right? I mean, concrete is the worst substance for recycling, and the construction business is the most backwards in so many ways, right? And now, all of a sudden, yeah, we can print the house, we can print the chairs, and they used to be very ugly, yeah. and now they're getting better. Sometimes I joke that the next step is to print the people who are going to be in the house here. Yeah. <laughs> I hope they don't get to go there, but you never know, right? So, we're living in the biggest uh, technological transformation in human history. I mean, all the stuff we saw before, the electricity, the, the printing press, books, computers, and the internet, and now, you know, now we're here. We're at the, like the total takeoff point of all the stuff that used to be science fiction. If you're in the oil industry, you know this. It's the end of oil sooner or later, right? whether it's 10 or 15 or 20 years, we're going to have new technology that makes more money. And it's better for the environment. Science fiction becoming science fact. Now, if you're a scientist, you will, of course, debate this. Because there, you know, there's always things that are not working. <laughs> and not everything is exponential. But let me show you this short clip, just as a bunch of examples.
So when I look at these examples, I could go on for the next five hours. You know? I always say, you know, the biggest challenge that we're facing is not globalization. This is where America is wrong, right? It's automation. We're going to automate so many things, then we have to say, well, if everything's automated, what do we do? And who gets the benefit of automation? But automation is something that we're inventing ourselves, so there's so many positive things about it. I'll tell you more how we're going to solve the other problem on the other side, but basically this is what's happening in the next year, uh, 10 years. We're going to stick in the old business, even farming, right? and energy, and city, and out comes the smart business. Right? Smart farming, smart energy, smart city, smart home, maybe even smart government. That's an oxymoron, I just can't but. But anyway, I mean, government is, in fact, a very interesting example. Social security administration, passports, voting. I mean, if we can digitize that, how much money can we save? Of course, then there's a the question of surveillance and trust. And, right? But anyway, we're going to go into this age, and that's basically everything that we do is going to be digitally transformed. But let's not transform one thing that's really important. That's us. There's many things about us that should not be transformed. There's many things that we need to keep. I mean, uh, social media is the best example. Right? The blessings of social media is everybody can be a broadcaster, everybody can you know, have fans. But the negative effect is most of the news we have on social media is in some way or the other an algorithm. Right? It's very easy to manipulate. That's not so good. So we have to think about this. You know, this is a huge temptation. We're again, uh, roughly a $100 trillion transformation. And this is really the low-hanging fruit for you in this room. Look at your business and say, okay, what can I make smart? What can I connect? What can I make more efficient? But also, how can I invent new things? This is the main thing that, of course, we're talking about, like the Internet of Things, right? smart cities. We can save 50% of energy, make deliveries more efficient, and so on. But then there's, of course, a huge issue of security you know, that we have to solve. And then, of course, self-driving cars and, you know, assisted driving. This guy, is very, this guy is very excited about his self-driving car. But uh, that's going to be assistance basically everywhere, right? <laughs> so he's really enjoying himself. And then, and then we have, uh, you know, assisted machines like Cortana, Siri, Amazon, Echo, Alexa, Google Home that we can speak to. I'll show you an example there shortly. And augmented reality allows us to do things like Tom Cruise in Minority Report. I mean, this thing costs about 5,000 euros right now. <laughs> what is that? How many pesos? That's a, that's a lot of pesos. But it's a Microsoft HoloLens. It's amazing. Imagine what you can do with that as an architect, as a doctor, as a policeman. For social terms, you know, I think this would not be so acceptable in a social environment, but it's a great professional tool. So in my book, I talk about what I call the mega shifts. Okay? The mega shifts are a keystone of digital transformation. When people ask me about transformation, they usually mean digitization. But it's a lot more than that. So to go more into depth, we won't have the time here, but I did publish in my book chapter three on this, but uh, you can download the whole thing at megashifts.digital, and it's also in Spanish, the entire chapter, megashifts.digital. Uh, you can do that later if you wish. But I'll, sh I'll show you a couple of examples. So this whole thing is like, imagine like a moving map of change. Right? All these things are happening at the same time. For example, cognification. That means machines are getting smart. Machines can look at patterns, they can learn, what's called deep learning. They can understand the world, not like we do. Ah, but they're, they're no longer dumb. Right? And this is basically, everywhere you look, people are talking about intelligent systems and you know, cognified possibilities and so on. And that leads to virtualization. Like now you can have a virtual copy of your machine that's in the shop, you have your machine here, and then you have a digital twin here that allows you to maintain it and to predict maintenance and, you know, and basically make it more efficient, more transparent. You have robots everywhere. I mean, the industrial robot used to be $150,000 10 years ago. Now it's $10,000 for Baxter, and it'll be $1,000 in five years for a simple robot. I mean, we're going to have to live with that and figure out how do we actually live in a world that's augmented, where we see augmented reality, mixed reality. There are many issues about this, of course, like confusion, <laughs> uh, you know, things that we would mess up, and lastly, automation. It's, it's both a very amazing opportunity, but also a big social challenge. Right? 
I always say the more that we automate, the more we have to also protect what should not be automated, which is not exactly an easy thing to do when you think about all of the move, moving things that we have here. I'll give you a short example again on what, what's uh, already happening in this turf. I mean, believe it or not, people are now actually buying elevators that are connected, elevators that can talk, because they want to use the data. Well, five years ago, it didn't matter. So now every elevator company is connecting the elevators and making sure they have the Internet of Things integrated there. So again, the mega shifts, mega shifts digital if you want to download for the rest of it. So let me explain what transformation really means for us and go beyond the standard stuff. You know, I do so many talks on transformation, and. In many, in many countries and, and companies, people say that transformation is everything that we don't know goes, becomes transformation. It's not quite that simple. I think really what we're seeing here is that the physical world and the digital world are, are coming together. They're converging. I mean, that brings a lot of cultural changes. I'm sure you know, you know it's, it's almost impossible to go offline these days. I always say offline is the new luxury. It's like you get a benefit, you don't, you don't connect. Five years ago, it was like, yeah, I want to connect. That's a huge benefit. And now you're saying, oh, I don't have to connect. I'm, you know, I can relax. Like on the airplane, it used to be on the airplane, but now it's everywhere. So physical, digital, and then, of course, humans and machines. And we're going to not converge, but we're going to collaborate a lot more. And the third point is the important one. It could be awesome, as I say, across the border or it could be worrisome. Why could it be worrisome? Because uh, technology is basically now everywhere. We can't even do anything without technology anymore. <laughs> and how does it change our society? And what do we need to know? Do you think in the future that everybody has to be an engineer because we have so much technology? Well, the answer is no, because technology will engineer itself. Well, not always, but in some instances, I'll explain in more detail a little bit later. But here's the problem with the worrisome, right? You know what the business model, what the companies are that are running this kind of business model? Right? Data mining. The top 20 companies of the world are using this model. Google, Facebook, Alibaba, Amazon, uh, Baidu, and so on. It's on the top 20 companies in the world are data mining our information. To which I would say, too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing. I think you know this from beer and alcohol and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, yes, we, we don't make it illegal, but too much of it is probably also. You know, so we're not going to make Facebook illegal, but too much of Facebook is a bad thing. You know? So how are we going to find the compromise? Well, here's the story, right? Governments have to monitor, supervise, and regulate. There's no way around it because, you know, just in the case of Facebook, we're talking about 2.6 billion people with one guy named Mark Zuckerberg holding 63% of preferred stock who can decide whatever happens. He's the most powerful man in the world. He is the true president. So I think regulation is an interesting topic here. Users must make choices and industry leaders must be accountable. You are accountable for what you invent. That's basically what it is. So I think that's something we need to think about and discuss. Yeah, I'll talk later about what I call digital ethics. Same example. Take this example here. If you're in the healthcare business, you know, scanning my DNA, my biomes, my phenotype, all the information in my body currently costs around $11,000. If I have this information, I can predict diseases. I can connect with other information, and I can prevent diseases. I can go from sick care to healthcare. I mean, think of this opportunity. So I would say a clear yes to that, but also a clear no to the other. Right? 
I don't think it's a good idea if, if we then think that the human is a machine because we've scanned the body. I don't know about you, but I don't believe that humans are machines. An argument can be made, has been made, and I'll cover it later, but this is, of course, a huge challenge in our thinking. So let me talk about humans and machines, transformation of work, because that goes with the transformation of our general uh, landscape around us. This is our future. We're going to work a lot more with technology. Whether it is an actual robot or a, a virtual robot or a software or intelligent machine or an app or voice controlled or a helmet or whatever you want to call it, right? Because these are extremely powerful tools. I mean, imagine you're wearing a helmet, you can go inside the data, you can figure out what goes where in a hundred times as fast. That's kind of like being a superhuman, if you want. If you want. Stats are really quite simple. Machines will increasingly do the routine work. Uh, this stat from the World Economic Forum is actually an understatement. It says uh, 2025, 48% of work will be done by humans and the rest by machines. I think it's a lot higher than that. But don't fear. This is actually a good thing. I explain why. It's a hard thing because it's an inevitable change, but it's also a good thing because basically anything that can be digitized or automated will be. Music is digitized, books are digitized, films are digitized, the bank is digitized, insurance is becoming digitized, government is going digital, manufacturing, production. That's called the end of routine. So look at your own job and say, which part of my job is routine? And then you can sort of see how automation will come in and do part of that job, like you know, using software like Slack or other things that can automate things. So here's an estimate of what will happen here. This is the percentage uh, of the work that can be automated. So if your travel agent, 56% can be automated, a text preparer, 54%. These are global numbers. Does that mean we'll be out of work? It means that some of our tasks will be automatable. So with the free time that we have, we can do other things, or we can just say, well, we, don't, we work less. It's also an option. So that's not altogether a bad thing. But if your job is 100% routine, like checking out at the supermarket, that's just 100% routine, and that, that means the end of the entire job. Right? But here it just means the end of a task. So I looked at my own job just for fun. There's a website where you can check this. It says there's 51% likelihood I can be automated. I would say that's pretty high. Huh? That's not all I do, a public speaker, but uh, this will be the GERD bot then. So you can, you can ask the GERD bot about the future. But I'm not worried because, you know, I think, okay, if I can automate, for example, an intelligence report or fact-finding, then I can do other things. And I have already adjusted. In my business 10 years ago, we sold, we sold reports on the future. The future of Switzerland, the future of whatever, right? And we made lots of money, but you know, now you go to Google Trends and you ask them about Switzerland. Uh, just in two years, you'll, you'll be speaking to IBM Watson about the future of Mexico, or we'll give you an answer. Maybe you can have IBM Watson run the country then, you know, as a cheap solution. But here's the flip side. Anything that cannot be digitized, and there is a lot, becomes extremely valuable. And what is that? I mean, it's obviously clear, you know, think about what we actually do. We build relationships with the clients, we build trust, we negotiate, we create new business models, we invent stuff, we make mistakes, we discover things. Can a machine do any of those things? Uh, you could argue, yes, uh, eventually it will learn how to have imagination. <laughs> but it is still a machine. You know what makes a machine, what makes a human? We actually exist. Machines don't exist, and they shouldn't. Will you call that existence when they're really clever? Maybe that's a discussion, right? But clearly, we're going to go in the future that we'll see this. Non-routine work is the future. You can already see this chart from The Economist. Anything that's non-routine, if you have kids, this is what they have to learn. Don't let them learn any routine. That includes about 80% of an MBA. So 
learn stuff that's not routine, whether it's manual, you know, craftsmanship, artists, plumbers, electricians, manual, non-routine, or cognitive, non-routine. These things will be at least 50 years before a computer understands what purpose is or, or passion. I mean, all of you have passion for your work. That's why we're here. Can a computer have passion? I think it can understand when we have passion, right? But, uh, you know, to have, uh, as they say in, in Buddhist uh, uh, literature, they say, a, a human is distinguished by the capability to suffer. That's what makes us human. Machines don't suffer, so... New skills. Think about education. Think about your kids. This is what they needed a little while ago, and the World Economic Forum says, okay, in the future, critical thinking, creativity, emotional intelligence, cognitive flexibility. Do you know what those people were called 10 years ago that had all the skills? They're called troublemakers. If, if you talk to an HR department, they would say, no, we don't want an emotional person that asks critical questions. We want somebody to execute. And now you want somebody that can execute because you have to execute and that has emotional intelligence. And there's lots of literature showing that, research showing that basically women have a lot more emotional intelligence than men. So we have some catching up to do. That's understanding stuff, right? That's, that's where the future is going. And though our schools are going to change, we're going to go away from this traditional approach of STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, because we think if you have a STEM job, you can save the day. And today you can. In 10 years, it's about what I call hecky. Humanity, ethics, creativity, imagination. So if you have kids who are going to school, they should learn that. Because a computer will never have that. Of course, if you can have both, great. You can be a scientist and a humanist, even better. Bottom line is this, when we talk about transformation, Machines don't do, don't understand, don't want, don't care about relationships. And what does the human brain care most about? I mean, you may be another case when you think about technology in the wider sense that we don't really care much about data. We use data because, you know, it's, it's interesting. What we care about is relationships, engagement, experience, and trust. This is why you can be successful with a client that, that, uh, that you can trust and the other way around, provided that you have the right product. Machines don't do that. They don't understand how that works. And trust, I'm afraid to say, is not digital. There's no app for happiness. You can't download an app, say, push the happy button to 10, I'll be a happy man today. Right? That's not how it works. So when you're transforming, make sure you don't forget this, right? that it's a relationship between you and the customer. If you have bad technology, you're not serving the customer right, you're being inefficient, that, that will not work. Right? But the other way around, you can have great technology and no trust, you're still dead. So it goes to hand in hand with what we want to do in the future. Let's talk about artificial intelligence for a second. I get this question all the time. Here's a very simple formulation. We're going from computing in terms of being programmed to computers that are cognitive, that are thinking. Okay. Now, when you think about thinking computers, it's actually a very bad word because these computers aren't intelligent and they're not thinking. Not like us. They're thinking in the sense of zeros and ones. But they can think about a hundred trillion zeros and ones. Do you know how much we can think about? 230 trillion calculations per second. That's what our brain can do. But in an entirely different way than a computer. And Demis Hassabis, who runs DeepMind in London, a famous AI company because of the game that they cracked, the Go game. Computer systems that turn information and data into knowledge. That's AI. Now, if I would see this, I would say, wait a minute, you know, this is what I do. I have knowledge. Can the machine have knowledge? Well, the answer is, it can have a certain kind of knowledge. Like all of you know TripAdvisor, use TripAdvisor, yeah, TripAdvisor. When you use TripAdvisor, does TripAdvisor have knowledge? You say, well, yeah, yeah you know, sometimes it's interesting, it tells me what to do. 
but you know, I have better knowledge because I, I'm, I'm right in front of the restaurant and I know it's bad, yeah? no matter what TripAdvisor tells us. When you use Google Maps, all of us, without exception, question Google Maps. Right? And why is that? That is because it has great knowledge, but there's, there's a few things it doesn't quite know yet because they're not data. You know there's going to be a demonstration or some incident or so because you know from what you read that you don't go there now. Right? And how would, how would a machine know that? So this is very important that we distinguish in this way. I'll play you a short vi video about the most important application of AI today, and that is voice translation, voice recognition, and voice control. <laughs> Mira, mi amor, la vaca. ¿Cómo le hace la vaca? Hey, Google, what sound does a cow make? This is a cow. Hey, Google, toca el sonido de un caballo. Esto es un caballo. Well, this is the Google Assistant. That works pretty well, as you can see. But I wonder sometimes they're going to say, well, hey, hey Google, I need a wife. You know? Make a suggestion. You know? Get me married. You know? Take over my life. And you've all seen the autonomous car story. This is a really amazing story. Because as, we, as this is unfolding, it's quite clear that what we're talking about here is not intelligent cars. They're not drivers like we are. Not yet. They're assisting us. The real thing about technology today in the next decade is intelligent assistance. I'm still there, I'm still driving, I can read the newspaper. I mean, if you've ever been to Los Angeles in a traffic jam, the Tesla is a great thing to have. You can close your eyes a little bit, you can sleep, but you can't go away, you can't sit in the back, and I don't really want to. I think to have truly intelligent machines that can drive like us, that's quite a bit away, but this will be a really powerful future. Every car will have assistance. And I think we have to get used to and see what that means for our future. So let me show a short clip. This is a commercial by Michelob, the beer company. It, it shows really interestingly that difference between humans and machines. Right? Uh, so just, let me just play this real quickly. Here. It's only worth it. It's only worth it if you can enjoy it. Never mind the beer now. I, I not mean to promote the beer, but it's an important message. Right? The, the machine can do all these things, but it doesn't know anything about anything else that is of true enjoyment. That's a very important lesson, I think, for us when we look at the future, what it means. You know, because the future is going to be that all around us, machines will tell us what to do. You know, giving us notifications. By the way, this is the best thing you can do in your life. Switch off the notification now right? for everything except for your personal messages, right? for SMS or so. Because right? that's basically how, how it works here. I always say that algorithms know the logic of everything but the feeling of nothing. In other words, machine can tell us very good about reality and logic and facts and figures, and, but do they really know what matters? And so this is where we have to draw the line, I think, for us when we talk about transformation. This is a great graph showing artificial intelligence. You know, we have assisted intelligence, we have automation, we have augmented intelligence, and we have autonomous intelligence. This is where we have to ask the question. Intelligence that assists us, I will give that thumbs up. And that's going to be our future, clearly. But we do have to take a good look at what that means. And how can we create other things around it? Automation, we have to have a discussion. When we automate, what's going to happen to people who are automated away? Will we have an automation tax, as Bill Gates has suggested? Well, any such tax would be extremely sort of anti-capitalist, right? <laughs> but is there another option? Right? Big discussion point. Augmented intelligence, virtuality, also something we have to look at. And here on the last one, as Elon Musk has says, to me that's a clear no. We don't want machines with an IQ of a million connecting to a million other machines with an IQ of a million. That would not end very well for us. <laughs> but the reality of that is it's about 20, 30 years away. 
So we have time to discuss it and figure out how we can be safe. Let's put it this way. All of these things are going to be amazing for us. But we have to put a context in it. We have to understand how we use it, how we don't use it, because I think societies are driven by technology, but defined by humanity. In other words, there's things that we can be doing that technically is possible, but do we want to? And if we do it, how do we deal with the consequences? Because technology can help very soon pretty much do anything you want to. Getting this balance between humans and machines, getting that right is, is crucial, especially here, because you have a lot of cheap labor still. Right? So this whole discussion about those two things becomes really important. Sometimes better to keep people and make the machines change or bring in the machines and then upgrade the humans for other jobs. In Switzerland, where I live, all of the grocery stores are being automated at the checkout. So the big companies that run the grocery stores have said, we don't fire people, we train them how to go to the organic food department or to how to write recipes. So they haven't gotten rid of people, they've moved them to another human job. This, of course, has to be encouraged. So on one hand, we have privacy, identity, security, that's the stuff that we want. And on the other hand, we have the benefits, eh? liquidity, flow, efficiency. There has to be a balance. If there's no balance between the power of technology and what humans want, we are in deep trouble. Eh? So when we're transforming, we have to think about that too. It's a revenue model, and there's, of course, other models that also matter. That brings me to the Digital Ethics Council I've proposed in many countries, and some of them actually have them. In my book, I proposed this three years ago, that every country, every state, and every large company should have a digital ethics officer, a chief ethics officer, to understand what it does, what we actually do. Does your state have an ethics officer? This is not just about AI, it's about work, it's about all of those things, you know, because ethics is about doing the right thing, which, of course, is a, a tough discussion we can have later when we do the questions. But here's the bottom line. In this world, we're just coming. The world where machines are everywhere. This is the key question. Right? How do we put the human back inside? And make no mistake about this, you can transform as much as you want, but if all you do is technology, you become a commodity. And the last thing you want is to become a commodity, because commodities are cheap. Right? The price goes to zero. What do you actually stand for? What is the difference having it here rather than having it there or somewhere else? And that leads me to the new economic paradigms. This kind of thinking, Exponential growth at all times, growth, jobs, profits, yeah, more. that's not going to work here. <laughs> because there's other things, you know, that matter to people. And this is difficult, we don't really have an alternative to capitalism. We've tried a lot of things, right? There's no suitable model where we can say, well, let's do this instead. But, you know, so I've come up with what I call sustainable capitalism. Seems like an oxymoron as well. People, planet, purpose prosperity. And I can guarantee you in 10 years people will measure you along those lines. Are you doing the right thing for people, for society, for sustainability, for the environment? Does your company have a purpose? So you have companies like Unilever and Patagonia and many others who are already moving in this direction. And that's going to be a big challenge for us, how to figure out this business model. JFK said, GDP measures everything except that which makes our lives worthwhile. That was 1967. So how do we measure what makes our lives worthwhile? Well, it's those three things. Right? Business models that are good for everyone, the circular economy, sustainable, recyclable, and human benefit. And this is not an ideology. Because guess what? Now, if you make the shift to these kind of business models, there is a lot more money in there than ever before. It's just a different way of looking at society. So let me summarize and then we'll do some questions. First, the future is a mindset, it's not a time frame. So the future is not about what's going to happen up there in the clouds you know, in five years or somewhere over in the US or in Europe or whatever. The future is in our heads. The key question is for you, do you have a future mindset? 
Now, you can't buy a future mindset on Amazon. You have to, you have to train it. Five to ten percent of your time should be spent in looking at things that don't already exist, that may exist. That's how big companies transform, for example. Our governments, our small companies, just looking at the future uh, five, ten percent of the time and saying, well, I just found this, you know, could that be interesting to what I do? Take a wider view. The music industry, from the, from, the, from the record to the cloud. The car industry, from owning a car to sharing a car. The banking business, from owning a building to running a blockchain system. And here's the challenge for you. You have to do the, the current thing, because that's what currently works, and then you have to invent the new thing while you're doing the current thing. That sounds kind of paranoid in a way, or schizophrenic. But it's essentially called hybrid thinking. So you spend your time doing today really well because that's what it works, but you have an edge product. You know, you're doing something that's maybe interesting for the future. And before you know it, if you do it right, those two things become even. And then in the future, the new core takes over. What do you think the German car companies did after the threat from Tesla, Toyota, General Motors? They said, right now, this you know, electric car, that, that's just a tiny piece. But now they came with it and said, okay, now we can have our future is going to be both. And then it's quite clear in 10 years, it's mostly about car sharing, mobility services, electric cars. In 20 years, it will be the exception for us to drive ourselves. And I say that as a German, you know, that's something to cry about in many ways, right? I enjoy driving, <laughs> but yeah, I think that's where we're going. So the hybrid thinking, take care of the present, and prepare for the future. That's really important. Requires a lot of energy and it should not be on top of everything else. Huh? The other thing is we need to hyper-collaborate. All of you in this room, we can't go to the future by ourselves. We have to be like this. Right? You can't own the future. Some companies think they do. <laughs> but, you know, it's very hard to own the entire future. You have to collaborate. I mean, if you're looking at what's happening uh, at, in terms of transformation, look at the news. Uh, we're going from this idea of an ecosystem, you know, Microsoft from the 60s and 70s, and, and oil companies and banks, you know, basically closed systems, to an ecosystem. Transportation, mobility, smart city, design, you know, data. That's what we're building. And that's the thing that we have to understand. The we will not get to the future by ourselves. It'll be too slow, it'll take too much money. It's about collaboration. So I'm going to wrap up saying the, uh, the game changes I showed you earlier, there they are again, they're happening everywhere, but I really believe that understanding those are, is going to be very important. On top of all of that stuff, I think we have to remember what we are and what we want, right? These are the things that make us human. The future is awesome humans on top of amazing technology. How do you get to be an awesome human? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, good question if you have kids especially. Eh? I can tell you one thing, you can have amazing technology if you don't have a brand or a purpose or humans involved, then it's still useless. On the other hand, yeah, you can have great relationships and have a great humanity, but if you have bad technology, you probably lose as well. Right? So that is the key to transformation. Transformation is about culture, and then it's about using technology, and it's about doing new things. I'll leave it with a quote from David Bowie, one of my musical mentors when I was in the music business. He's a very smart guy who said, the future belongs to those that can hear it coming. And I think this is the number one thing that we have to work on, is to hear it coming, and then we, we always react. I mean, every country I go to, when people hear the future coming and they develop ideas, they find a response. They find their way into the future. Thanks very much for listening. So I believe we'll take some questions now. Muchas gracias, Ger, por esta interesante conferencia. Ahora continuaremos con la sección de preguntas y respuestas. Los invitamos nuevamente a la aplicación para que puedan formular algunas de ellas. Las preguntas las haremos en inglés para que Ger nos pueda este, complementar con las respuestas.
La primera, the, the first one, which countries are leading the changes in industry 4.0 and why is that? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Actually, I, you know, the funny part when you talk about industry 4.0, we're actually going now to industry 5.0. Right? And that is everything that you know, automation, cyber physical systems, to artificial intelligence on top of all of those things. So intelligent machines are actually connecting to cyber physical system, creating a new platform. And of course, the countries like, you know, Germany is a great example, right? Germany is a country with engineering culture. So Germans like perfection. What Germans can do as well is to reinvent the entire thing, because it requires a certain amount of disrespect, like we do in Silicon Valley. You know, we, people in Silicon Valley reinvent stuff, and in China. Right? So if we're looking at what's happening in Industry 4.0, I think it's a combination of engineering and then experience, the experience economy, right? to figure out new ways. And I think the countries that are leaders are quite clear. I mean, Germany goes to leadership there. But generally speaking, I think we're, we're seeing still lots of momentum from China, from, from, from the US, that all coming together. But you know, I think we're so early in this process, it's still a wide open landscape. So I think you can still take leadership role there. Una más, por favor. <laughs> you can ask the hard questions, also in person if you so desire. Next one. Which tool can we use for preparing ourselves for this change to stay con competitive due to our old abilities? Yes, you know, there's only two ways that people change. And I think you know that from your personal life. That's also what makes us human. There's only two reasons that we change. It's called pain. That's the German part, and love. So we change when we have a reason. How do companies change? The pain of revenue loss, job loss, relevance loss, that they're saying, oh, God, we have to do something. Or they fall in love with a new idea. The German car companies realize, you know what? This is an amazing idea, self-driving, shared, autonomous, electric vehicles. Fell in love with the idea. Jeff Bezos fell in love with the Amazon Kindle, the e-reader. Nobody asked for it. So how do companies change? Well, we have to realize that there may be some pain coming, and then we have to come up with new ideas. That's how we change. In terms of our own thing, how we learn how to change, you have to make an effort, a conscious effort, of getting future ready, to get the future mindset. And that means read at least one or two or three books a month, if you can. I can publish a list if you want. You start with mine, of course. <laughs> uh, second, right, you, you follow people and you read things about what's happening in your turf and you look a little bit forward. Right? Five years, not 50 years. Right? When you have a future mindset, I observe it's not a question of age at all. Right? It's easier for a 20-year-old to have a future mindset because he doesn't have much of a presence. <laughs> but even if you're 60 years old, you, know, you can say, I'm going to develop a future mindset and that will be part of how I operate. Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. That was easy for Einstein because he was a genius. He did have a lot of knowledge. But imagination. So you wouldn't believe how many CIOs I speak to, you know, big organizations, and I ask them, what is the future of your company in seven years? And you know the answer I'm getting? Take a wild guess. The answer is, we're going to double revenues. That's not an answer. That's a desire. It's a goal. Yeah. What exactly are you going to be doing in seven years? What is your product? What will make you different? That's the question we have to answer. So as I described earlier, now we have the, we have the, we have the present. We work in the present. Don't spend 150% of your time in the present and ignore the future, because that means eventually you just run off the cliff. You have to understand what's coming so you can make a synthesis between the two. Great. Next one. It's a long one. <laughs> OK. How do you think the teaching model is going to be to look like in five or 10 years? And are universities going to adapt, to change, to die? And also, how are they going to be transi transitioning to go less STEM, the STEM. science, technology, yeah. Yeah. Uh, engineering, and math, and more HECI, human creativity, yeah. imagination. Thank you. 
So here's the thing, I think, you know, uh, in 10 years, roughly, computers will be virtually unlimited in power. So quantum computing, 3D computing, 5G networks, unlimited battery life, more or less, right? 10 years. Do you really think that in 10 years, the skills that we learn in school, which is to be like a computer, right? downloading memory at school? When I went to school, I downloaded memory. And so I can use it later. In 10 years, I have the world's knowledge here, right here. I just say, hey, tell me more about this. I can do that now. In 10 years, it'll be perfect. So what, do, what skills do we need in 10 years, or even before that? Negotiation, creativity, design, understanding, trust building, emotions, emotional intelligence. And where do you learn those skills? Can you learn those skills at school? Absolutely. But often not at our schools. The bottom line is, I think, when you look at education, the more you study like a robot, the more you work like a robot, the less jobs you'll have. So that means for education, we have to shift back to saying, okay, it's important that people understand things. It's important that they can make up their own work. A lot of research is showing roughly 70% of all new jobs in 2030 have not even been invented yet. So, I mean, think about that for a second. Right? What kind of program will we need to further this? Yeah? What schools do we need? I think this is also for us personally, you know, we have to spend more time on getting more intelligent emotionally and with understanding rather than with just facts. Yeah? So, I think this is the uh, inescapable future. And also, the other thing, we should not be too afraid of uh, changes in the work system, because in 10 years, maybe automation will lead to higher revenues that will allow us to pay people even if they're only working two, three hours a day. I mean, you'll have a good laugh about this one, but we talked 20 years about this sort of society where we work a lot less because we have technology. Right? Well, that, that didn't work. Right? We actually work more now because we have technology. Right? But there's lots of people saying in 20 years we may only work two or three hours a day for the same money or more because we have the benefits of technology. Now, that would take a lot of political discussion, and you know, I will not get into this, but that's why I'm an optimist. I think the future holds all these options. We just have to execute them right. What will be the focal point if we aim to build a bridge between STEM and HECI? Okay. Yes, well, um, all of us are different. Psychology shows that about 40% of us is essentially a fixed thing that, that we come with, that we inherit. Certain feasibility, talents, roughly 40%, and 40% of us is subject to our environment, our parents, our class, where we grow up, and then 20% is up for discussion. So even if we are optimistic, we can say, yeah, maybe 50% of what we are, we can shape ourselves. And so what we have to do is we have to focus on the opportunities that fit to us. We can't make a rule for everyone. You know, I think if you're a brilliant scientist, you will always find work. But if you're a brilliant routine worker, bookkeeping, accounting, auditing, then you have to shift. Right? So the challenge for us today is we have to take the current population of what we currently do, and then we have to upskill and upgrade while we automate so that we can invent new jobs. Take social media. Right? Social media 10 years ago, nobody knew what social media is. Today, 21 million people work in social media. 21 million. All of those people made their own jobs. Half of those people are working, not at a company, but freelance, inventing their own jobs. So, yeah, I think it's up to us for, uh, to figure out the up, upskilling and how we can generate this kind of skills that we need in the future. But let's be assured of one thing. Your brain is plastic. Right? Your brain actually changes with what we ask it to do. You switch off your brain because you always ask an app to do the work. You know, use it or lose it. <laughs> Our brain can change. 
People have potential. I've seen this all the time when I, was, when I work in Switzerland with a grocery store client. You move people from the cash register, you don't think they have a lot of skills. It turns out when they're switched off and they can activate the other part, they can actually do really well with the customer. They can write recipes. They can do online services. 10% of them don't make it. And clearly in this transition, we're going to need social programs to support this. So I think there's good news and bad news, but it's really all about the kind of decisions that we make when it's about new jobs. How can, how can we manage transformation in highly unequal societies? Yeah. <laughs> oh, like this. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> An equal and just society is not something that's going to be given to us by technology. I think you agree with me, the fact that we have these great technologies did actually not result in more equality. Because technology is a tool. It's not, you know, it doesn't have a higher purpose, it doesn't have its own agenda. You know? I think the science fiction writer William Gibson once said, uh, technology is not good or bad, it just is. It's morally neutral until we use it. So if we want a just and equal society, we have to use the benefits of technology and then create rules and social contracts and, and actual regulations and so on on top of it so that it can be achieved. I mean, take, for example, the enormous possibility of making healthcare cheaper. I mean, once we connect the DNA in our biomes, we can actually figure out how to heal diseases before they come. And then this would have to be made available to everyone. So this is a very, very big system challenge for us, you know, put that in place that it can actually happen. And we have to be clear about the goal. I mean, inequality is the number one problem for criminality, right? for terrorism. It's the number one issue that we can solve only if we solve it underneath, not just on the top. So this is why I think the technology companies today are saying, you know, we want to be regulated. <laughs> so that the benefits of technology can be applied to everyone. I mean, think about this. In 20 years, we may solve cancer by genetic engineering. If we were to solve cancer, which would be great, of course, even if it was only one person, right, would that operation cost a million dollars? Because it's licensed by a pharma company? Would it be free? And if so, who pays for it? I mean, these are all questions that we're going to have to debate in this transformation. I can, tell, I can tell you one thing for sure. The opportunities we're looking at right now are the biggest ones ever, really, in this turf. And we have to figure out how we're going to streamline this so it becomes a human benefit. Great. Another one. How can Mexico and other Latin American countries can prepare for this future shock? Yes, uh, okay. A country of 130 million people, roughly, right? Is that it? Yeah? yeah Maybe a few more. Obviously, there's a great opportunity just by size. To get ready for this, I think we need to think about various things. For example, how do we teach our kids? Do we have money for startups? Can we generate entrepreneurship? Do we have research that supports all the technology that we're developing? Can we create an economic logic based on transformation? One thing that we should not be doing, and this is a very common problem uh, in larger countries, is that we focus on technology because of efficiency. So we use technology to save money, bring up the margins, kick out people, uh, because people are always expensive, right? That's a very short-term approach. We have to have a long-term approach. There's amazing opportunities right here. I think one solar energy. Renewable energy, quite clearly. The revolution of banking. I mean, there's an amazing opportunity there to be a global player. Artificial intelligence, I think, is kind of a spoken for topic, right? Healthcare, energy. I mean, there's lots and lots of possibilities. And of course, in this area, I would also invest a lot of money in the future of the automotive industry. There's lots and lots of things to be done. So I think that the question is really the other way around, you know. Out of this whole menu of what we could be doing, what exactly is the best possible future? So I live in Switzerland. Um, Switzerland is now working to reinvent the future of banking using the blockchain, 
using the cloud, using digital money, because banking has traditionally been the biggest factor in Switzerland. But you know the future of banking as we know it is closing like this, right? It's eventually, it's a, it's a closing window. So to reinvent that is a great opportunity. It does involve larger thinking. I always like to say that technology is not our savior, but it's not our destroyer either. It's just a tool. We use technology to achieve things that we want. And that's important when we think about the future. Next one. Should the future of the industry, should the future of the industry be the design of products and experiences that elevate your human potential? That's the question. It's, it's, if so, where do you think we should start? Uh, there was a book, 1999, called The Experience Economy, I think uh, by, by a guy named Pine, Pine and Gilmore. It was very early in this discussion, but they talked about how technology will make it more important for us not to buy products or services, but to buy experiences. And this has become very true. If you're looking at the millennials, you know, millennials are kids between 22 and 35, Generation Y. They're growing to be the most important group of consumers in the world in the next decade. And you know what they want most? They want to spend money on experiences. So that is, for example, not owning a car, but sharing a car. Not buying a house, but sharing a house. And that is really changing our entire society. So all we do is going towards the experience economy. I mean, Airbnb is a great example. Uh, Airbnb has many problems, but now Airbnb has created a new product called Airbnb Experiences, where you can go to any country in the world and you can say, I want to take a dancing class, a cooking class, I want to be in a recording studio, uh, I, want to, I want to talk to a graphic designer, I want to go on a boat ride. And Airbnb facilitates the experience. And that has become a huge product already. Now think about what that would mean for you. The car, for example, is shifting from a product to a service to an experience. In fact, the first time I drove in a Tesla, I don't have one, but I drove it a few times. I don't have any more car. I have no car at all. But when I drove in the Tesla, I sat there and I looked at the large screen in the middle. And I could talk to the screen like I was in a science fiction movie. And that was like seven years ago or so. I almost bought the car the same day just because of the screen, yeah. the experience. When I drove the Tesla, it wasn't like driving a car. It was a completely different experience. And that's what we have to invent, the experience. That's why those companies like Amazon, Apple, uh, Facebook, Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, and so on, right? That's why they're so, um, so powerful and so successful, because they create experiences. And that's really true, I think, for all industries, to create experiences. Another one. Digital and technology war between USA and China, or maybe some others. Okay. Your opinion on that, please? <laughs> Are oh, you getting all the good questions now? That's good. Okay, first, when we talk about China, we have, to, uh, we have to understand that many things that we hear about China are public relations. When you go to China and you realize what people are doing there, you know, it's not that they have a magic sauce of any kind, except for more liberty of doing things that we wouldn't be able to do here <laughs> for various state reasons. But in China, you know, it's not like they, ha they own AI. It's not like they own everything. So that's a little bit of an overstatement. Um, I think there's a danger that we take technology like artificial intelligence or human genetic engineering and that it becomes sort of a weapon, you know, in this conversation about who is the most powerful player. And Putin is doing the same thing in Russia, and this is a, a global discussion, right? But the point is, you know, most of those technologies are not ready in the sense of here today. They're being developed step by step. Right? And even China has to pull back and say, well, the doctor that changed the genomes of the baby, remember that about three months ago? There was a doctor who did an operation on, on, on a baby that was born with CRISPR-Cas9 operational uh, method. Um, even that doctor was actually put to jail. and eh? he's, he's in jail now, he's waiting to see what happens. They have to play along with us as well. So I think the polarization of US and China 
is going to weaken in the future. There's lots and lots of players like Europe, you know, that are going to become more powerful. And if you're looking at the future, it's quite clear in terms of GDP growth, in terms of importance, and the growth is clearly going to be in places that are non-traditional places. Um, of course, Brazil, if it comes back, India, and I, I think Mexico belongs in that same group in general purposes. We have time for one more. What is the role of the 5G technology in this change, and who is leading the race? <laughs> Good questions. Yeah. So 5G is amazing for many reasons. Uh, 5G is not just because it's faster, you know, one gigabyte download. It's because it's real time and no latency. So if you were to operate a robot, or if you're a doctor operating through telepresence, it's like real time. Right now it's 100 milliseconds or so on 4G which would be deadly in operation. <laughs> right. But 5G, almost no latency at all. You could be in a holographic display. I could, be, I could be standing here somewhere else in the world. I can do all these things. That is going to be truly amazing. What 5G also does, of course, is that we become even more dependent on the network. That we use technology even more frequently. And I really believe that we need to say that we use technology to a certain degree, but maybe we don't use it for this. You know, we stay, we stay human in that way. Because I think the problem is that to be not connected is it's a very bad thing, but to be overconnected is also a bad thing. And somehow, I think the telecom companies need to think about that too. You know, when you I work a lot with telecoms, and what I hear all the time at those events is that. Connectivity brings gains, brings purpose, brings, you know, brings everything. And that's true. But when you connect too much, it also takes things away. So the balance is going to be what we want. Because in, in 10 or 20 years, it'll be like air. You know, the internet will be like air. It will just exist everywhere. I mean, today we have 2.6 billion people on the internet. No, no, 3.6 billion. In 2030, we'll have roughly 9.5 billion people on the planet, maybe 10, and 90% will be connected to the internet in high speed. Nine billion people, just 10 years from now. So think about the opportunities and the challenges like privacy and those kind of things. So I want to wrap this up by saying that my, my belief really is that we need to embrace technology, but not become technology. I think that is the key to transformation for me. Thanks. Thank you. De nuevo agradezco a Ger Leonhard y le hacemos entrega de este presente por acompañarnos y compartir esta experiencia. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you.